Chapter 42 of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 42. Dear boy, and Pip's comrade, I am not a goin for to tell you my life like a song or a story book, but to give it to you short and handy, I'll put it once into a mouthful of English, in jail and out of jail, in jail and out of jail, in jail and out of jail. There you've got it. That's my life pretty much, down to such times as I got shipped off, arter. Pib stood my friend. I've been done everything, too, pretty well, except hanged. I've been locked up as much as a silver tea-kettle. I've been carted here and carted there, and put out of this town and put out of that town, and stuck in the stocks, and whipped and worried and drove. I've no more notion where I was born than you have, if so much. I first became aware of myself down in Essex, a thieving turnips for my livin'. Some had run away from me, a man, a tinker, and he took the fire with him and left me very cold. I knowed my name to be Magwitch, christened Abel. How did I know it? Much as I knowed the birds' names in the hedges to be Chaffinch, Sparrow, Thrush, I might have thought it was all lies together, only as the birds' names come out true. I supposed mine did. So fur as I could find, there warn't a soul that see young Abel Magwitch with us little on him as in him, but what caught fright at him, and either drove him off or took him up. I was took up, took up, took up to that extent that I regularly growed up, took up. This is the way it was that when I was a ragged little creature as much to be pitied as ever I see, not that I looked in the glass, for there weren't many insides of furnished houses known to me, I got the name of being hardened. This is a terrible hardened one, they says to prison visitors, picking out me. May be said to live in jails, this boy. Then they looked at me, and I looked at them, and they measured my head, some on em. They had better a measured my stomach. And others on em give me tracts what I couldn't read, made me speeches what I couldn't understand. They always went on again me about the devil. But what the devil was I to do? I must put something into my stomach, mustn't I? Howsomever, I'm a getting low, and I know what's due. Dear boy and Pip's comrade, don't you be afeard of me being low. Tramping, begging, thieving, working sometimes when I could, though that warn't as often as you may think, till you put the question whether you would have been over ready to give me work yourselves. A bit of a poacher, a bit of a laborer, a bit of a wagoner, a bit of a haymaker, a bit of a hawker, a bit of most things that don't pay and lead to trouble, I got to be a man. A deserting soldier in a traveller's rest, what lay hid up to the chin under a load of taters, learnt me to read. And a travelling giant, what signed his name at a penny a time, learnt me to write. I warn't locked up as often now as formerly, but I wore out my good share of key metal still. At Epsom races, a matter of over twenty years ago, I got acquainted with a man whose skull I'd crack with his poker, like the claw of a lobster, if I got it on this hob. His right name was Compison, and that's the man, dear boy, what you see me a pounding in the ditch, according to what you truly told your comrade arter I was gone last night. He set up for a gentleman, this Compison and he'd been to a public boarding school, and had learning. He was a smooth one to talk, and was a dab at the way of gentlefolks. He was good-looking, too. 
It was the night afore the great race, when I found him on the heath, in a booth that I'd knowed on. Him and some more was a sitting among the tables when I went in, and the landlord, which had a knowledge of me and was a sporting one, called him out and said, I think this is a man that might suit you, meaning I was. Compison, he looks at me very noticing, and I look at him. He has a watch and a chain and a ring and a breast pin and a handsome suit of clothes. To judge from appearances, you're out of luck, says Compison to me. Yes, master, and I've never been in it much. I had come out of Kingston jail last on a vagrancy committal. Not but what it might have been for something else, but it warn't. Luck changes, says Compison. Perhaps yours is going to change. I says, I hope it may be so. There's room. What can you do, says Compison. Eat and drink, I says, if you'll find the materials. Compison laughed, looked at me again very noticing, give me five shillings, and appointed me for next night, same place. I went to Compison next night, same place, and Compison took me on to be his man and partner. And what was Compison's business in which we was to go partners? Compison's business was the swindling, handwriting forging, stolen banknote passing, and such like. All sorts of traps as Compison could set with his head, and keep his own legs out of, and get the profits from, and let another man in for, was Compison's business. He'd no more heart than an iron file. He was as cold as death, and he had the head of the devil aforementioned. There was another in with Compison, as was called Arthur, not as being so christened, but as a surname. He was in a decline, and was a shadow to look at. Him and Compison had been in a bad thing with a rich lady some years afore, and they'd made a pot of money by it. But Compison betted and gamed, and he'd have run through the king's taxes. So Arthur was a dying, and a dying poor, and with the horrors on him, and Compison's wife, which Compison kicked mostly, was a having pity on him when she could, and Compison was having pity on nothing and nobody. I might have took warning by Arthur, but I didn't, and I won't pretend I was particular, for where be the good on it, dear boy and comrade? So I begun with Compison, and a poor tool I was in his hands. Arthur lived at the top of Compison's house, over nigh Brentford it was, and Compison kept a careful account again him for board and lodging, in case he should ever get better to work it out. But Arthur soon settled the account. The second or third time as ever I see him, he come a-tearin' down into Compison's parlor late at night, in only a flannel gown, with his hair all in a sweat, and he says to Compison's wife, Sally, she really is upstairs a longer me now, and I can't get rid of her. She's all in white, he says, with white flowers in her hair, and she's awful mad, and she's got a shroud hanging over her arm, and she says she'll put it on me at five in the morning. Says Compison, Why, you fool, don't you know she's got a living body? And how should she be up there without coming through the door, or in at the window, and up the stairs? I don't know how she's there, says Arthur, shaking dreadful with the horrors, but she's standing in the corner at the foot of the bed, awful mad, and over where her heart's broke, you broke it, there's drops of blood. Compison spoke hardy, but he was always a coward. Go up alonger this drivelin' sick man, he says to his wife, and Magwitch, lend her a hand, will ye? And he never come nigh himself. Compison's wife and me took him up to bed again, and he raved most dreadful. Why, look at her, he cries out. She's a-shakin' the shroud at me. Don't you see her? 
Look at her eyes. Ain't it awful to see her so mad? Next he cries. She'll put it on me, and then I'm done for. Take it away from her, take it away. And then he catched hold of us and kept on a-talking to her, and answering of her, till I half believed I see her myself. Compison's wife, being used to him, gave him some liquor to get the horrors off, and by and by he quieted. Ho, oh, she's gone. Has her helper been for her? he says. Yes, says Compison's wife. Did you tell him to lock her and bar her in? Yes. And to take that ugly thing away from her? Yes, yes, all right. You're a good creature, he says. And don't leave me whatever you do, and thank you. He rested pretty quiet till it might want a few minutes of five, and then he starts up with a scream and screams out, Here she is! She's got the shroud again. She's unfolding it. She's coming out of the corner. She's coming to the bed. Hold me, both on you, one on each side. Don't let her touch me with it. Ha! She missed me that time. Don't let her throw it over my shoulders. Don't let her lift me up to get it round me. She's lifting me up. Keep me down. Then he lifted himself up hard and was dead. Compison took it easy as a good riddance for both sides. Him and me was soon busy, and first he swore me, being ever artful, on my own book. Dis here little black book, dear boy, what I swore your comrade on. Not to go into the things that Compison planned, and I done, which would take a week, I'll simply say to you, dear boy, and Pip's comrade, that that man got me into such nets as made me his black slave. I was always in debt to him, always under his thumb, always a workin', always a getting into danger. He was younger than me, but he got craft, and he got learning, and he overmatched me five hundred times told, and no mercy. My missus, as I had the hard time with, stop, though, I ain't brought her in. He looked about him in a confused way, as if he had lost his place in the book of his remembrance, and he turned his face to the fire, and spread his hands broader on his knees, and lifted them off and put them on again. "'There ain't no need to go into it,' he said, looking round once more. "'The time with Compison was almost as hard a time as ever I had. That said, all said.' Did I tell you as I was tried, alone, for misdemeanor, while with Compison? I answered, no. Well, he said, I was, and got convicted. As to took up on suspicion, that was twice or three times in the four or five years that it lasted, but evidence was wanting. At last, me and Compison were both committed for felony on a charge of putting stolen notes in circulation, and there was other charges behind. Compison says to me, separate defences, no communication, and that was all. And I was so miserable poor that I sold all the clothes I had, except what hung on my back, afore I could get jaggers. When we was put in on the dock, I noticed first of all what a gentleman Compison looked, with his curly hair and his black clothes and his white pocket handkerchief, and what a common sort of wretch I looked. When the prosecution opened and the evidence was put short aforehand, I noticed how heavy it all bore on me, and how light on him. When the evidence was given in the box, I noticed how it was always me that had come forward and could be swore to how it was always me that the money had been paid to, how it was always me that it seemed to work the thing and get the profit. But when the defense come on, then I see the plan plainer, for, says the counselor for Compison, my lord and gentlemen, here you has afore you, side by side, two persons as your eyes can separate wide, one, the younger, well brought up, 
who will be spoke to as such, one, the elder, ill brought up, who will be spoke to as such, one, the younger, seldom have ever seen in these here transactions, and only suspected, the other, the elder, always seen in them, and always with his guilt brought home. Can you doubt, if there is but one in it, which is the one, and, if there is two in it, which is much the worst one? And such like. And when it come to character, weren't it compassin as had been to the school, and warn it his schoolfellows as was in this position and in that, and warned him as had been knowed by witnesses in such clubs and societies, and now to his disadvantage, and warned it me as had been tried afore, and has been knowed up hill and down dale in bridewells and lock-ups, and when it come to speech-making, warned it compusin as could speak to him with his face dropping every now and then into his white pocket handkercher, ha, and with verses in his speech too and warn't it me as could only say, Gentlemen, this man at my side is a most precious rascal. And when the verdict come, warn't it compusin as was recommended to mercy on account of good character and bad company, and giving up all the information he could again me, and warn't it me as got never a word but guilty. And when I says to compusin, Once out of this court, I'll smash that face of yourn. Ain't it compusin as prays the judge to be protected, and gets two turnkeys stood betwixt us? And when we're sentenced, ain't it him as gets seven year, and me fourteen? And ain't it him as the judge is sorry for, because he might have done so well? And ain't it me as the judge perceives to be an old offender of violent passion, likely to come to worse? He had worked himself into a state of great excitement, but he checked it, took two or three short breaths, swallowed as often, and, stretching out his hand toward me, said in a reassuring manner, "'I ain't a-going to be low, dear boy.' He had so heated himself that he took out his handkerchief and wiped his face and head and neck and hands before he could go on. "'I had said to Compison that I'd smash that face of his,' and I swore Lord smash mine to do it. We was in the same prison ship, but I couldn't get at him for long, though I tried. At last I come behind him and hit him on the cheek to turn him round and get a smashin' one at him when I was seen and seized. The black hole of that ship warn't a strong one to a judge of black holes that could swim and dive. I escaped to the shore and I was a-hiding among the graves there, envying them as was in em and all over, when I first seen my boy. He regarded me with a look of affection that made him almost abhorrent to me again, though I had felt great pity for him. By my boy I was give to understand as Compison was out on them marshes too. Upon my soul I half believe he escaped in his terror to get quit of me, not knowing it was me as had got ashore. I hunted him down. I smashed his face. And now, says I, as the worst thing I can do, caring nothing for myself, I'll drag you back. And I'd have swum off, towing him by the hair, if it had come to that, and I'd have got him aboard without the soldiers. Of course he'd much the best of it to the last, his character was so good. He had escaped when he had made half wild by me and my murderous intentions, and his punishment was light. I was put in irons, brought to trial again, and sent for life. I didn't stop for life, dear boy and Pip's comrade, being here. He wiped himself again, as he had done before, and then slowly took his tangle of tobacco from his pocket, and plucked his pipe from its buttonhole, and slowly filled it, and began to smoke. "'Is he dead?' I asked, after a silence. "'Is who dead, dear boy?' "'Compison.' 
He hopes I am, if he's alive, you may be sure. With a fierce look, I never heard no more of him. Herbert had been writing with his pencil in the cover of a book. He softly pushed the book over to me, as Provost stood smoking with his eyes on the fire, and I read in it. Young Havisham's name was Arthur. Compison is the man who professed to be Miss Havisham's lover. I shut the book, and nodded slightly to Herbert, and put the book by, but we neither of us said anything and both looked at Provis as he stood smoking by the fire. End of chapter